Hello, Herbrand. Uh, thank you for accepting my invitation to Emerd. Uh, we're meeting today to speak about your two creations, ways to submit and commitment phobia. Uh, in order to let people you know better, you are an artist, performer and director from Germany. You grew up in the United Kingdom, where in 2007 you got your diploma for, uh, from the Darlington College of Arts. Then you got a master's degree in theater in Amsterdam, where you live today. How do the places where you live in have an influence on your work? Well, I think definitely the places I studied had a big influence on my work. So I studied at Dartington College of Arts, which was a very, doesn't exist anymore, but it was a very experimental, small, contemporary arts college. And when I went there, it completely changed my whole perspective of what theater could be, I suppose, or what performance could be. So that was very transformative for me. And it also was a place where the focus was on uh, lots of collaboration and also devising what we called devising work. So making your own work as an artist, not just having to be a, um, I suppose, a writer or a director or a, but getting to do all these things. So for me, this really changed because I was able to understand that I could make my own work Before that, I thought I was going to be an actor and perform in other people's work. So this really changed my direction. And also, I started making much more experimental, I would say experimental work. And then I worked in England for uh, yeah 10 years. And then I moved to Amsterdam to do a master's. And again, this education program <laughs> really shifted what I was able to do because... In the UK, I was working in a system of getting funding to make a work, to tour a work, which was brilliant, but not often not a lot of space for experimentation or really taking risks <laughs> because you're reliant on funding and short working periods and this kind of thing. So then I had two years doing a master's where I was really able to research again, to go back into being, to learning. <laughs> and uh, not having to be so public with my work for a period. And actually that was incredibly nourishing. And yeah, I was able to, to experiment more, I suppose, and, and try some things that were more risky and they were allowed to fail. So in that sense, I think definitely the institutions I was in shaped my work. And then about the places, uh, I guess I, f I don't know if I have much to say specifically about sort of Amsterdam versus England. They're both Western European <laughs> uh, countries or places. There are some differences in, of course, the society and the culture. And I guess I believe very strongly that I, the context I live changes who I am and therefore the work that I make like yeah so it informs it but I'm not sure that I have a very clear insightful thing about what exactly the difference is the starting points of your works come from your personal life how in a concrete terms do you manage to create a universal signification uh, out of something personal if I knew <laughs> if I knew the answer <laughs> then making art would be a lot easier <laughs> I guess it's always a part of a research process, which is I start from a personal experience, like something that affects me in the world or bothers me or that I have a question about. And then I pay more attention to that thing in my life. And I research, I read a lot. So I try to place it in a kind of, I would say, theoretical context, although I don't think in the end my work is very theoretical, but it Part of the process is, is um, yeah, I don't know. I'm making a work about power, so I read about power <laughs> to understand different perspectives on it. Then I think it's just kind of like doing <laughs> the work of trying to find the right form. And I also work with collaborators and uh, with a dramaturg usually. And I, I, th I think often those people are very crucial in helping me to focus on it. Where is it too 
personal and how how do we make it how do we open it up from a story about me <laughs> to something that is relatable but i suppose at its heart i think most things can be made <laughs> Uh, applicable to other people and I think I'm also drawn to kind of large themes like power or gender or you know that I think most people have some kind of relationship to how do theater and performance help you question societal norm and convention well I a friend of mine once uh, said about my work that I I make theater and performance as a way to practice being in the world in ways that I can't otherwise be in the world. And I think this is very apt. I think it's now in my artistic bio, but I really think of theater. For me, it's really a space to practice some relationships and perspectives that I don't find so easy to access in the world. So um, with ways to submit, it's quite a clear example because the frame of the show allows me to behave in ways that I don't feel able to behave outside or to try things that I don't feel able to try outside. Yeah, for example, before I made a show where I performed in male drag, I had a male alter ego. So this was really a work around gender and power. So again, a kind of practicing being something that I can't be. <laughs> elsewhere and then I would say again through processes of kind of researching learning about the topics expanding my knowledge about the topics and I think also the like the process of translating a, a theme into a form into an aesthetic into a relationship with an audience like this is a kind of analysis also it requires a kind of analysis and a close thinking <laughs> about how are you gonna achieve that Does the medium of performance help you question the body? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, it does. How <laughs> is the question? Well, um, I perform in my own work. So one thing is that I'm always putting my body into the experience of the work. So literally, I learn through through the body, through doing. I think it is a kind of recurring curiosity like I talked just now about a show in drag so this was very much about how is my body read as a female body or how might it be read as a male body and what is the difference and when I speak what is the difference if you think it's a man talking or a woman talking and in ways to submit it's a very physical work where I have a physical relationship with the audience so I really put myself into a physical encounter with a stranger. It produces all kinds of <laughs> feelings and experiences and things for me to do that. And I think actually I'm always, I'm often trying to construct frames in my work where, well, for me, theater is about look, looking and being seen. So the work is very direct with an audience also. It, it, there's no fourth wall and it's really addressing the audience. And I think I play very consciously also with this, this relationship of uh, being looked at and, and wanting to be looked at also, and then sometimes not wanting to be seen and, and then physical experiences, I think also that kind of put my body into a particular physical state So I'm often very interested in tiring myself out. So in ways to submit, I get very exhausted, for example. And in commitment phobe, it's not so obvious, but we are building a construction. So it's work, small work, but it's work, you know? So there's a real, um, yeah, there's a practice and a, a physical challenge also to the performance of it that I find very exciting. <laughs> For myself in a ways to submit the public is invited to have a physical fight with you in order to question the relations of domination as submission in how societies but uh, i was wondering if an underlying question of this theme couldn't be about power and publics 
I mean today, what kind of public could or would be in the capacity of seeing this performance to sharper, sharpen its critical mind? I would love the work to be seen by anybody <laughs> and everybody. And I guess I try quite hard to make the work, to make my work accessible. So it, 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 has intellectual ideas behind it, but I think in the end, the product is not super inaccessible. I think it's easy, actually. I'm always trying to tread a line between entertainment, something offering something that is enjoyable to watch and entertaining to watch, but also brings criticality and problems to people. I think with Ways to Submit, it's a very interesting one because I think it's quite exposing for people to participate because they are doing it in front of a room full of people. And um, I think a lot about who would or wouldn't choose to put themselves into this position. And I think already in the last few years, this has changed a bit. So this is a bit simplistic, but for example, I think these days men or male presenting bodies are less likely to engage in the fight with me I think five years ago, they were much more willing. And I think this reflects for me a kind of societal shift also about all these conversations around consent and gender and power and that people are coming now with a very different awareness of their own position and how they will be perceived. So I think this has changed a bit. For example, I performed at a, a festival that was a Um, a queer arts context and the, the show was very different because it was an audience who already were you know again I'm being simplistic but generally I would say the audience are already very self-reflective about, about gender about presentation about relationality so I think it really does shift in terms of the audience Yeah, in a way, I would love to bring it to kind of, I'd love to do it in the street almost, you know, to really see how does somebody who thinks theatre isn't for them, <laughs> I believe they could still get something out of this experience. Of course, doing it in public has some risk attached to it. I, yeah, so far we haven't done this. <laughs> But the other thing I was going to say is I'm very interested in how different members of the audience have different perspectives on the same thing. I might be sitting next to somebody and we're watching the same fight, the same physical interaction. And one person is like, go, go stronger. I want more vi you know, violence. Or I want it to be real, you know, and the other person, because of their history and their references and their sensitivities or whatever might feel like, oh, it's too much, you know, it looks, lo looks like violence. I don't want to see it. And I notice this a lot, that this tension happens with different people in the room. And I find this very, uh, for me, very important and very exciting that the audience, um, they're looking at the same thing, but they have different perspectives and desires about that thing. I guess uh, there is a very precise protocol that uh, sets boundaries for this performance. Uh, but have uh, you ever lost control during the performance? How did you react? No, not fully. But I, uh, I get tired. So I do nine, I do eight fights in the show. So once we're halfway through, the audience is doing one and I've already done six or something. So I'm, I get physically, uh, not just physically, actually, also emotionally and mentally sometimes it's tiring and I, the fights do affect me. Like I say this in the work also in the show that um, I want to do it, I'm choosing to do it, but I'm not immune to what happens. I feel the things that happen, not just physically, I also, f I feel them as a emotional body. <laughs> You know, I, they, they impact me. So I definitely think there is a loosening of control, like not full loss of control, but it, I get loose. Uh, I, I get easy and I get tired and I, 
uh, yeah, my whole physicality changes, I think, a bit, but also my intellectual ab ability to process. So, but this is part of what I'm interested in, is putting myself in that state and in the performance. Um, towards the end, there is a section where I, I'm, it's no longer scripted. So I'm free to speak what comes up for me or it's improvised. And to me, it's very exciting. How are we as people when we are not like <laughs> very controlled and presented and held together? And um, I think that has the potential at least to offer something very real <laughs> or honest to an audience. And I am excited by that. And I would say that definitely things do happen that surprise me and I surprise myself in reaction to the audience. Uh, so in terms of, uh, yeah, like it's almost like I'm trying to lose control a bit, you know? I like it when this happens. I want to see what will happen to me and what can happen between us. And uh, In a commitment phobia, you proceed to build in front of your audience a reaction machine. Uh, each one of your decisions has a direct impact impact of the machine's reaction. Mm -hmm. And saying the pictures of the show remind me of uh, building a game of uh, children. Uh, do the society and how it designs today make us perceive the world too seriously and does this show want us to do the opposite? I think we need both. I think we need both serious, critical <laughs> thinking and action and uh, difficulty. And I think we need playfulness and pleasure, I suppose. And I think that's a little bit what I'm often trying to find in my in all of my work. I think this, yeah, it's not one or the other. Both things are necessary. And I think in... In Commitment Phobe, there are like there are audio recordings that are talking about moments of doubt and uncertainty and this having to take a position, having to position yourself like the world demands constantly that you know and that you take a clear personal position, a clear political position all the time. And I find this uh, almost oppressive sometimes. <laughs> That's what sort of what the work is about. Um, and at the same time, I recognize it's important sometimes <laughs> to know uh, what you stand for and to take a position. So in a way, the, the work is trying to occupy both these spaces. In my opinion, people are, are contradictory <laughs> and inconsistent. And um, I think to ask them to always be so clear and know is like not very helpful. <laughs> Um, so I think it, we are trying to propose something about a more playful, fluid ability to change your mind and to be wrong <laughs> and for that to be okay. It's also a kind of artistic tactic to get people to have a good time <laughs> and then think about something that I've, I've, I feel quite strongly about, you know. And um, when we were making the performance, we built the chain reaction machine ourselves, so we we me, my perf other performer and my sonographer, we designed it ourselves, but we are not chain reaction machine designers. So we had never done this before. So we spent weeks in a studio playing with objects, trying to make a cup hit a ball and it would just go wrong and go wrong. And like, it was very trial and error and it was very frustrating. And then when it when you got it to work the three of us were like children like so excited such joy such pleasure like you really felt even though we'd been trying to make it work for like four hours maybe <laughs> you know so there was a moment in the process where when i observed that we were getting so delighted by it working I, that was like, ah, there's something in this. If I can communicate a little bit of this pleasure and joy to an audience, then I think we're onto something, you know? I think we're going somewhere good with the work. So yeah, there is, there is not enough joy <laughs> for us most of the time. So let's find it where we can, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, your performances follow two different configurations. 
you either perform alone or with someone. Why did you choose for commitment phobia to perform with someone else, namely Tanya Mlock Jensen? Yeah, Tiana. Yeah. Tiana. Yeah. So the way I make work is that I um, I know the thematics and I know the the topics I'm interested in, but I don't know the form. So when we started, I didn't know that we were going to end up making a chain reaction machine. <laughs> so, so these decisions have to come from somewhere, and often they come from a slightly intuitive place. I think the starting point for this show was that I wanted to make a show about doubt, doubt and uncertainty, and not knowing. And I realized that for me, uh, doubt is very relational also. It's sort of to do with like, I have my belief or opinion and then another person appears and they have their belief and opinion and either their belief affirms my belief, <laughs> they agree with me, <laughs> or they have a counter position and then I go, oh, maybe they're right and I'm wrong or like, so something about this, this for me personally, this feeling of doubt and uncertainty, it's very relational. And also the other kind of strand in the work is about, a strand of material in the work is about this question, this kind of quite contemporary question of having to take political positions and know where you stand on any issue. And again, this feels very relational. It's about other people. Or for me, often it feels like it's, it's as much about how other people will perceive me or, <laughs> yeah, as really like what is my core. <laughs> feeling so I sort of just because of this relationality I was like okay it makes sense that there will be another performer there will be another person on stage and that it's not just me and the audience but there is this dynamic between two people also um and thank god we made that decision because I don't think I could do it on my own <laughs> yeah are the reactions different depending on the country you perform in Well, we don't, we've never performed in France before, so I, I will tell you next week how, how it is here. With Ways to Submit, it's often quite obvious that certain cultures or certain, let's say, theater audiences within certain cultures uh, uh, have different relationships to the idea of participation because it's participation. You don't have to participate, but some people from the audience need to participate. And in the Netherlands, where I live, um, I notice that people are very keen to get up and volunteer. When we performed in Belgium, much less so, like people much more, less willing to get up. So with this show, it's quite obvious, I think. And with Commitment Phobe, I don't know, we haven't, um, yeah, we haven't performed it so much. We performed it in the Netherlands, Belgium, England and Germany. I wouldn't say I noticed huge differences there with that work. But again, you know, like I said earlier, they're not like uh, radically different cultures or, or anything. So I would be excited to <laughs> see. I think also this question of, it would be exciting to see also how the question of doubt and uncertainty resonates differently in different places. A few years ago, I was in Brazil I was talking to some artists in Brazil about doubt and one of the artists said to me, ah, it's a privilege to be able to doubt. And I mean, it was just a very brief statement and we didn't go for a long time into this conversation, but I thought, ah, it's also interesting. No, I come from comparatively a very privileged position where I have the space and time to question everything. And so I think it would be interesting to see how, yeah, whether or not that self-questioning and questioning of everything is present in other other very very different cultures also transmission seems to be really important for you for instance you were a teacher at the royal holloway university of london for two years uh, what do you like about teaching uh, how does transmission have an influence on your artistic work with how changing is its nature Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a cliche, I think, but I find it very, it feels very satisfying and worthwhile <laughs> to be with young people who are learning to do a thing that I love and that I want people to do in the world. 
Like I want there to be artists desperately. Yeah, I don't know. People always say about teaching, it's very kind of satisfying now because you're teaching the, <laughs> the next generation. But I, it, it's a cliche, but I also think on some level it's true. I guess there's also a beautiful kind of feedback to to you as a maker who like at, at a certain point you maybe you're quite experienced you think you know the things <laughs> to look at the work through a kind of less experienced gaze you know to see the things that come up for people I often find this very exciting and I think it also I work right now with quite a lot of artists as a kind of artistic advisor so not teaching in a educational capacity really but advising them on how they're making their work it's very interesting because i think i have to position myself in a different kind of critical position of like i give advice but i also have my own tastes and opinions and i am this person is trying to make their own work not my work mm -hmm. so to understand what about the things that i know are like really specific to my practice or are kind of based on taste, you know, and what things are more like a applicable to all different kinds of work. Like if somebody's making uh, yeah, a very experimental dance work, this is not my practice, but what do I know that can still help this art to be made? Just generally, I think a good challenge to your own biases and your own habits, you know, you get into habits and so to be like, with people who are doing something different. <laughs> It's just very useful. <laughs> to conclude this interview, uh, what themes would you like to work on for your future creations? For me, all of my work, like each project always comes out of the previous project, I think, more or less. Like I'm doing a research, there is something that isn't finished or not completely resolved for me. And then this becomes often the seed of the next work. So it, for me, this is very clear with ways to submit into commitment phobe. Like I can see how the question of doubt and uncertainty came out of this other show. <laughs> and uh, actually the new, I'm starting work very slowly on a new project about uh, running and exhaustion. So I'm a runner as well and um, I do this process, which is an exercise for me, but it does something similar to me as the fighting does in Ways to Submit, for example. It puts me in a physical state where I'm less held together, I'm less controlled, I'm open to something else in a different way. Yeah, I guess, so have been interested in various ways, exhaustion, and now I want to make a piece of work explicitly about exhaustion. It's also a thing that I... I love watching in performance. I love watching people working really hard. And at the same time, I have this critical perspective of a world where everybody is <laughs> exhausted and the kind of uh, neoliberal capitalist structure that we live in is very uh, exploitative and extractive. And I guess the sort of starting point for me is like, I love working hard in this physical capacity. I love watching people do it, but also what does it mean to value people when they are working hard <laughs> and when they're exhausted and when they're giving everything, like what are the parallels? And yeah, obviously that's not the same, like exercise is not the same as trying to exist under capitalism, but I think it can provide some, some way to think about these kind of wider structures and what we demand of people. Yeah, so that's the next idea. <laughs>